Okay, welcome to Psych 101 General Psychology. Today we are talking about memory. And we're going to talk about uh, all this stuff. Actually, not all of it, um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be broken up into two lectures, or so two separate videos. So yes, we're going to define memory and the processes in a moment. We're going to talk about the information processing model of memory. And, uh, you know, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, okay? And then that's about uh, as far as we'll get. The nature of remembering, biology and memory, cause of forgetting, that stuff will be, um, we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Okay, so let's get started. Here's an image for you guys. It's in your book. It's figure 8.2. Um, uh, what this basically tells you is that memory involves uh, three things. It involves encoding, storage, and retrieval. Okay. Now, you probably already know what storage means. You know what retrieval means. What the heck is encoding? Well, there's your definition there. Encoding involves the input of information into the memory system. Encoding is basically when you first access the information. Okay, so when you see something, you hear something, you smell something, you know, whatever it is, you take, your senses take up information and it enters the memory system, okay? It says there, next to the flow chart there, that encoding could be visual, auditory, or semantic. So yes, encoding could be visual. Uh, so let's say you, um, you can visualize something uh, to make it easier for you to remember. Like for instance, you can visualize, um, let's say uh, someone who is like, a, let's say you have to learn somebody's name. You have to remember somebody's name. And that person's name is Matt. Okay, well, you can visualize Matt with a mat over his head to help you remember his name. So in that way, you've encoded the information visually. You've created a visual image to help you remember. You can also encode the information in an auditory way, right? You can use rhythm and rhyme. You can turn things into a little song to help you remember something. Remember, right, when you were learning the alphabet and there was that little song, right? That helps you encode the information. Okay, so when you encode the information, you're doing something to the information to help get it into memory. You can also uh, encode uh, in a semantic way. Semantic means it has to do with words. So you can create a little story, let's say, uh, for something uh, to help you remember it. All that would be encoding. So encoding is basically uh, inputting the information into the memory system, but not just that, transforming the information, doing something with it, so you can get it into the memory system. That's encoding, okay? Storage is retaining the information, right? Keeping it stored so you can use it later. And then when you use it, that's called retrieval, right? When you get the information out so that you can use it, so you can think about it, so you can be aware of it. That's retrieval. So memory involves encoding, storage, and retrieval. Let's keep going. Now we're gonna talk about something that uh, probably the most important part of this lecture is the information processing model of memory. The information processing model of memory is basically, think of it like a theory that explains how memory works, okay? And it was proposed way back in 1968 by Atkinson, Schifrin, by Atkinson and Schifrin, okay? The information processing model of memory. It basically says that memory, human memory works like a computer. Now in the 60s, computers were new, okay? But Atkinson and Schifrin had enough, uh, I guess, enough sense to know that memory must work in a similar way, okay? So human memory works like a computer according to the Atkinson Schifrin model of memory. So information first enters sensory memory. So that is like the computer accessing information, right? When you type into it, for instance, right? And then some of that information is stored into short-term memory. For the computer, that is like random access memory that is basically when the computer runs programs, right, is working with information. That is short-term memory. And short-term memory, you'll find that in a moment, is also called working memory. So that is when you use information. And then some information is, this, and is then transferred to long-term memory. And that is like storing the information on your hard drive, on the computer. So you can use it months later, years later, right, assuming that the computer is, still works, that the hard drive hasn't gone bad. Okay, 
That's what the theory says, that human memory works like a computer. If you don't understand the analogy of the computer, don't worry about it. For now, what you need to know is that human memory basically has sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. And we're going to define each of those three steps in memory. And then there is a link there uh, for the information processing model of memory, the link with the three little stars there. Uh, if we were in class, I would play that for you you know, that video and that it explains this model of memory, explains how memory works. Um, we're going to have to skip the video because a lot of you complain that you can't hear it, right, when we're trying to do this via Zoom. Um, so we're going to skip it. You guys can watch it on your own. But I am going to talk about the steps. I'm going to talk about what sensory memory is, what short-term memory is, and how long and long-term memory, and how these things work. So basically, you're doing essentially the same thing the video does. The video is just a you know, you hearing it another time uh, with a different voice, slightly different explanation that would help you understand it a bit more. So first step in memory is called sensory memory or the sensory register. We can abbreviate that SM, but usually the abbreviation I use, we can just call it the sensory memory or the sensory register. This is simply when you first encounter information. It's brief memory of things just encountered. So it's basically when you see something, when you hear something, you smell something, right? It's your senses taking in information. That's sensory memory or, or sensory register. Your senses aren't really meant to store information. So sensory memory doesn't last very long. Now, there's two kinds of sensory memory that have been studied the most, and that's iconic memory and echoic memory. An iconic memory is, is simply memory for things that you've seen. So iconic memory is uh, basically the mental representation of a visual image. Iconic memory is memory for things that you've seen, that you've just seen, okay? So it decays in less than a second. Uh, iconic memory, visual images that you've just been exposed to, uh, decay in about uh, a second. As a matter of fact, about maybe half a second, less than a second, half a second, okay? So if you see something, and you immediately look away, in about half a second, you've already forgotten that. Because you didn't focus on it, you didn't think about it, you didn't analyze it. If you don't use the information, you are simply looking at it, you simply see something, for instance, as soon as you look away, it's gone. For instance, like let's say on your drive to work, right? You drive to work and uh, on your way, you see other cars, there's other people in those cars, you know, you can see what those cars look like, the color, you can see often the people inside the cars and what they look like. You saw all of that stuff, but you didn't pay attention to it, right? You might have seen it for a brief moment, you saw it and then you immediately looked away, right? So if somebody asks you when you get to work, hey, you know, what kind of cars did you pass on the way over here? Did you pass any cool cars, you know? Or what color were those cars? What did those people look like? You probably can't say because you've already forgotten that information. In about half a second, that information, that visual image fades. You did nothing with it. You didn't think about it. You didn't analyze it. You didn't focus on it. So it immediately goes away. That's called iconic memory. Now, there are those that have photographic or eidetic memory. That is rare. And those are those individuals that remember everything. Okay. So someone with photographic memory when they drive to work and they see all those people, all those cars, right? They get to work. If somebody asked them, hey, what did those people look like? What did those cars look like? They would be able to tell you exactly what those cars look like and what colors and what those people look like. They would remember all that stuff. That is rare for people to have that kind of memory, but that's photographic memory. That usually doesn't happen. Your brain naturally filters out most information because most of it is useless. You don't need to remember all that stuff. So you see it, you hear it, maybe you smell stuff, right? And you immediately forget about it, okay? That's your sensory memory, sensory register. That's iconic memory. Now, if you're talking about memory for things that you've heard, that would be echoic memory, the mental representations of sounds. So if somebody tells you something and you don't think about that, in about three to four seconds, that information is gone. You forget in about three or four seconds. So echoic memory decays in about three to four seconds. So it's like when your mother, let's say, is giving you a lecture, you know, and she's telling you, haven't I told you not to do this before, right? And, you know, she's going on and on, 
and you're just basically like, uh, you know, like uh, you're not paying attention and you're just thinking in your head, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know what, you know, I heard this before, blah, 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 right? You're just not paying attention. You're hearing her, but you're not listening. What happens in about three or four seconds, three or four seconds later, you're gonna have forgotten what she said. And sometimes they know you're not listening to them. So they're giving you this lecture and they can tell you're not listening. And then they stop and tell you, what did I just tell you? What did I just say? Repeat back to me what I just told you. If it's been less than three or four seconds, you can repeat what they just said. But if it's longer than that, you've already forgotten. Okay, that's a quick memory. A quick memory is memory for things that you've heard last about three or four seconds. Iconic memory is memory for visual things that last for less than half a second. Okay, and that is all part of sensory memory. Sensory memory, our base is just your senses picking up information. Yes, and they pick up visual images, they pick up sounds. Yeah, and all your other senses as well. Smells, taste, right, touch. Yes, that would also be part of your sensory register, right? It's just your senses picking up information. We're only talking about visual stuff and stuff that has to do with sounds because that's what has been studied the most. So that's your sensory memory. Now, if you pay attention to the information, if you do more with it, it will enter what's called short-term memory. Short-term memory is when you focus attention on a stimulus to retain it for a minute or so. Short-term memory is basically when you can remember something for a short amount of time, maybe a minute or two or something like that, right? It's short-term memory. That requires for you to pay attention. So you can see attention there is in bold, in the light blue. You need to pay attention. You need to focus on something to remember it for at least a little while. If you don't pay attention, if you don't focus, then you're only using sensory memory and it disappears within seconds or less. So if you pay attention, then that information gets into short-term memory and you can remember it for a few minutes, okay? Short-term memory is also called working memory because it is the kind of memory that you rely on when you read a list of words. When you're reading a list of words, you are focusing on those words. You are thinking about them. You are working with that information. So you remember that for a few minutes. When you're solving a math problem, you're thinking about it. You're focusing on it. You're using your working memory. That memory is gonna stay in there for at least a few minutes, okay? When you're talking to someone, you're thinking about things, okay? Focusing on certain things that you say, that is short-term memory. When you tie your shoes, you're using short-term memory. You're using working memory. You are working with information. You are remembering things, you're doing things. Whenever you're doing anything, whenever you're working with any information, whether it's numbers, whether it's uh, words, or if you're, even if you're doing something physically, you are using your short-term memory, which is also called working memory. Most psychologists call it working memory. I like to call it short-term memory because it implies that it only lasts a, long, a short time, but it's also called working memory. Short-term memory has a small capacity. Why? Well, because how many things can you really pay attention to at the same time? Research shows that it's only about seven things plus or minus two. So you can remember about seven numbers if you're average, right? Seven numbers. And that is how many numbers there are in a phone number if you exclude the area code. You can remember that phone number for a few minutes. After a few minutes, it will be gone, okay? But remember, you have to focus on the phone number. You have to think about it. And you can remember it probably for a few minutes, okay? If you're a little, if your memory's a little bit better, plus two, you can remember about nine different numbers. If your memory's a little bit worse, minus two, you can remember about five. That's the reason why phone numbers, by the way, have seven numbers, because they know that that's about how many numbers people can remember without having to write it down, okay? You can remember it only for a few minutes though, while you're focusing on it, while you're thinking about it, while you're thinking about that number. Let's say you, let's say somebody told you that number, okay? And you're thinking about it, right? You have a few minutes while you can continue to think about that number so that you can write it down, okay? Or maybe record it on your smartphone. After about a few minutes, it will be gone, okay? Um, so short-term memory has a small capacity because Short-term memory has to do with those things that you are actively thinking about. 
that things, those things you have in conscious awareness, whether it's a phone number or whether you're thinking about what you're saying or whether you're reading a book or tying your shoes, that is what you are thinking about. And you could only think about so many things at the same time. About seven things, plus or minus two, whether it's words, numbers, or whatever it is, okay? And short-term memory is subject to something called displacement. Displacement means that something gets pushed out when a new item pushes out an existing item, when the system is full. So let's say you already have seven numbers that you have to try to remember. You haven't written it down. You haven't put it on your smartphone yet. Somebody gave you a phone number. Let's say you met someone and they told you their phone number. You have a couple of minutes for you to consciously think about those seven numbers, okay, until you forget it, right? You have a couple of minutes. You can do that, okay? If you're average, okay, about seven, seven numbers, okay? What if, though, the number is a different area code and now you have to remember the area code? Well, because you have to remember the area code, you are going to forget some of the other numbers because it's too much. Now it's 10 numbers, not seven. There's too many for you to keep in mind all at the same time. So what's gonna happen is you'll remember the area code, but some of those other numbers are gonna get pushed out of a conscious awareness. You're gonna forget those. That is displacement, okay? Unless your memory is a lot better, then maybe you can remember the area code too. But usually the, the area code is additional numbers. If it's different than yours, that means you have to remember the area code. And then, well, now you can't remember it. It's too many numbers. You're gonna get some of them wrong, okay? That's how short-term memory works. So short-term memory is basically information that you pay attention to, that you focus on, information that you're working on, okay? And you could only, information in conscious awareness, and you could only have about seven things, plus or minus two in conscious awareness. And when there's more, things get displaced. Now you can do things to improve your short-term memory, okay? There are ways to improve your short-term memory. Way, there are ways to make the information last longer, longer than just a few minutes. You can use what's called maintenance rehearsal or rote rehearsal. And you could also use elaborative rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal, also called rote rehearsal, is simply when you just repeat the information over and over again. So when you're repeating that number, that phone number over and over again, and you're saying it over and over again so that you won't forget it, you are rehearsing the information. You're trying to maintain it in memory. That's maintenance rehearsal. You are repeating it by rote. You're repeating it in order. That's rote rehearsal. You're trying to keep it in, in memory longer, okay? That may lead to long-term memory. If you, say that, if you say that phone number over and over again, if you repeat it hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, you will probably remember it for a long time. It will get into long-term memory. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, see, your instructor is older, right? And uh, I remember the time when we didn't have smartphones. Not only did we not have smartphones, we didn't even have those flip phones that, you know, it's, you know, that uh, basically can store phone numbers. We used to have those old kind of phones and all they did was make phone calls. You couldn't store any numbers in them. You couldn't search the internet on them. It was just these stupid phones, okay? All they did was make phone calls. So you had to dial the number. You have to push every button, okay, on these old phones. And so let's say you had a girlfriend or something like that, like I did, okay? And, you know, I got her phone number, you know? At, at first, course, at first the, you know, I wrote it down, of course, right? But then every time I had to call her, right, I would look at the, uh, at the phone number and then I would push the buttons and call her. And I would do that several times a week. We talk all the time, you know? Because it was an innocent relationship, okay? I didn't have a car, all right? And we talked all the time. And every now and then we saw each other. It wasn't that often, okay? was poor, I didn't have a car. She lived like 30 minutes away, okay? So um, guess what? I was with her for like three years. So I must have called her thousands of times. And because I repeated that information over and over again, because I dialed that number over and over again, I still remember that phone number today. Even though I haven't been with her in more than 20 years, I haven't called her more than 20 years. She probably doesn't live there anymore. Actually, I heard she moved to Vegas, okay? She doesn't live there anymore. Um, but um, yeah, that's, 
wrote rehearsal. I repeated the information so much. I dialed that number so many times. And every time I dialed that number, I had to remember it. I had to think about it. Okay. Or I had to look at the paper because I did that so many times that information is in long-term memory. And I probably won't forget it until I get much older and my brain starts going back. Okay. But I still remember that phone number. Okay. Cause it was like three years. I must've called her thousands of times. Okay. I know that sounds desperate, but that's all we did is we talked on the phone. Okay. Now you guys, of course, have smartphones. You don't have to remember the damn phone number. You record it on your smartphone and you give, and then you, you make a contact, there's a name, and now you just click on the name or you know, touch the name and you don't even have to look at the phone number. So there are many phone numbers that you guys have on your smartphone. And if your smartphone went bad or your battery died, you won't be able to call those people, even on another phone, because you won't remember because you have not rehearsed it. Okay, you haven't. Okay, um, now, Maintenance rehearsal is not a very good way to get things into memory. It takes too long. To get something into long-term memory with maintenance rehearsal, you have to repeat something hundreds of times, thousands of times. It takes hours and hours. It is not a good strategy. And by the way, that's exactly what some of you are gonna try to do when you take your exam, right? You're gonna study and you're gonna look at your homework questions over and over again, trying to remember them. And if you're really gonna do that, you better study for hours because it takes a long time to use that strategy. There is a better strategy called elaborative rehearsal or deep processing. That is when you think about the information deeply, when you relate the information to something you already know, like escaliers. If you need to learn the word escaliers, which is a French word, if you know the word escaliers is related to escalator, it looks like escalator, right? Then you can learn that word instantly. Escaliers really means stairs. That's what it means. Well, you know what? That escalator that moves up and down by itself, it has stairs too. It has those steps. So now that you've connected those two things, now you can remember the word escaliers. And next time you see that word escaliers, even if it's months from now or years from now, you see the word escaliers. You let's say you go to France, you will probably know what that means because you have connected it in memory. You see how simple that was? It often takes a little bit more time to engage in lab tip rehearsal though. Like when I gave you that, inf that um, when I told you guys that story about that ex-girlfriend and the phone number, right? If you remember that story, you will remember what maintenance rehearsal is, what rote rehearsal is, okay? If you come up with your own story, that would be even better, but that is elaborative rehearsal, deep processing. You come up with a little story and if you make it meaningful, if you make it personal, it's even better because then it connects to you. But you connect the information to something you already know. You create a story and then it's easy to remember. That's what you should do with the information in a psychology class, in a history class, or whatever it is, that's how you remember things better. And you're not only remembering things, you understand things. That is a much better strategy, okay? But it requires you to think harder. And I know a lot of you don't want to do that. So you're just going to try to repeat the information over and over again. You're going to create flashcards, some of you, right? That's rote rehearsal, maintenance rehearsal. That is not a very good strategy, but it could help you. You can still get an A if you repeat the information enough, right? If you look at it enough. Um, but, uh, you know, guess what? Next semester, you probably won't remember a lot of it. If you use deep processing, then it will stick longer and you'll remember it better because this, if you do it, if you do enough of this, you do enough maintenance rehearsal, that takes longer, right? But if you do enough of it, or if you use a laboratory rehearsal, you're more, like, you're more likely to get it into long-term memory. Now, there's something else I need to tell you guys about short-term memory before we talk about long-term memory. Short-term memory is also subject to what we call the serial position effect. The serial position effect says that for a list of words, recall is better for the beginning items and the ending items than for the middle items. All right, that sounds confusing. The serial position effect says that we remember the first things on a list and the last things on a list more easily. That's what that means. So when you have to learn a list of words, whether it's a list of vocabulary words, a list of French words, or a list of presidents, right? Uh, you can always remember the first names or the first words on the list very well and the last ones. So you get the primacy effect. The primacy effect is tendency to remember the first words, the first items really well. And the recency effect is the tendency to remember the last items well. Recent, the primacy means that it's the first things on the list, you remember those well. And recency means it's the last things, the ones that are more recent, you remember those things very well. 
That's what happens when you have a list of words. You always remember the first stuff really well, the last stuff really well. The stuff in the middle tends to get lost. If you graph uh, the uh, memory, right, you get a U-shaped curve. For, so here we have a list of words. Horizontal, look at the, the horizontal line there, right? Uh, position on the list, right? You have word number, you know, two, four, six, right? And yes, there's also one, three, and all that stuff, right? 20 words. And then the probability of recall. So you can see for the first word on the list, there's over an 80% chance that you're gonna remember that one. And over 70% for the second, about 70% for the third, right? And the last words, there's over a 90% chance you're gonna remember the last word. And about 80% chance to remember the second to the last word. But look at the stuff in the middle. The stuff in the, in the middle, the graph is lower there. There's a lesser chance you'll remember those, like less than 50%, maybe less than 40% for some of them. So you get this U-shaped curve whenever you try to remember things in order, whenever you try to remember the lists, you know, whether it's a list of grocery items, a list of names, a list of numbers, this is what happens. It's subject to the serial position effect. So if you wanna remember things better, right, you wanna improve recall for the uh, middle items, then you need to change the order. But that's the serial position effect. Uh, I'll give you another example, just to make it more interesting for you guys. Right, let's say that, uh, um, let's say you're, okay, well, well, we'll say you're a girl this time, right? Let's say you're a female, and let's say you're heterosexual, right? And you've had a bunch of boyfriends, right? Guess what? You probably remember the name of your first boyfriend, maybe the second one, right? Maybe the third. And, and you probably remember your current boyfriend and the one before that and the one before that. But if there's a lot of them, if there's been like 20 of them or 30 of them, let's say you've had a lot of boyfriends, right? You probably don't remember some of them, do you? The names of some of them. No, you don't. Some of the ones in the middle, probably not, right? That's the serial position effect, okay? And I, I you know, I, I, I didn't have a whole bunch of girlfriends when I was in, in junior high and high school, but you know, I had my share, I had some here and there, you know? Uh, I don't know, there might've been close to 10 and all those years or something like that. Relationships back then, I mean, so I had girlfriends that only, that relationships only lasted like two weeks. <laughs> Some of them two months, right? Uh, they didn't last very long, all right? One did, and that was, uh, that was one toward the end, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, I can tell you, I remember my first girlfriend's name, right? Her name was Myrna. Actually, she wasn't really a girlfriend, but she's the first girl I kissed. I was at the park, I was like 12 years old. Actually, she kissed me. That was my first kiss. I remember her name, right? I don't remember the second girl I kissed or the third or anything like that. I can tell you the most recent one or the one before that and the one before that. But so never mind girlfriends, like the girls I've kissed, right? I don't remember all of them, right? I remember some of them. They weren't all girlfriends, by the way. But I remember my first kiss, right? I remember my most recent kiss, right? Or the person. Right? This is what happens. That's a serial position effect. Right? Uh, when you have things in a certain order, you always remember the first things and the last things very well. Okay, if you do enough rehearsal, if you repeat the information over and over again, or if you engage in what's called laboratory rehearsal, right, uh, you could get information in what's called long-term memory. Long-term memory, as the name implies, is long-term storage of information. That's when you can remember things for a long time. Long-term memory has a large capacity. Okay, it can store a lot of information. That's why it's called long-term memory. It's a vast storehouse of information, of a lot of meaningful information. A lot of things that you remember uh, that are in long-term memory that you can remember for years are things that are important to you. You remember your birthday, don't you, right? You remember your mother's name. If you have a brother or sister, you remember their names. Your dog's name, right? You remember your first kiss, right? Your first love, right? If you got married, you probably remember that. You know, you remember all this stuff. A lot of the things that you remember for a long time is meaningful information. Also traumatic events. You know that time you got into a car accident, you almost died. If that happened to you, you probably never forget that. That's a traumatic event, right? Or that time you got robbed at gunpoint, or hopefully something like that has not happened to you. But if it has happened to you, that's a traumatic event. You probably always remember that, right? I had a bike crash you know, uh, like six weeks ago. You know, I was riding my mountain bike up in those hills. I was going a little too fast on a turn. 
and the stupid bike slid and slammed me into the ground, broke a few ribs. I had to go to the hospital, right? Um, I'm just about better now, okay? I have a little bit of pain when I stretch, but I'm a lot better now. I'm almost normal. Uh, I'm never going to forget that. That was a traumatic event. I thought I was going to die. I hit the damn ground so hard. I hit with my head, okay? I was wearing a helmet. If I didn't have a helmet, I would be dead. But I hit with my head and with the side of my body. I broke some ribs. That's how hard I hit, okay? Um, I was wearing knee pads, but not my knee pads weren't the ones that got hurt. Right, it is my head and my ribs that hit. I hit on the side, right, on the dirt, right. If it would have been rocks, it would have been worse, but it was dirt. Uh, that's a traumatic event. I'll probably never forget that, right. I got all scared. I thought I was gonna die. At first, I was all out of it. I at first I thought, oh, I was really worried and 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 scared. I I when I first hit, I was dazed. I didn't know if I was gonna live. I hit so damn hard. I literally thought that I was dying, you know? It was traumatic. Um, but also information that you've rehearsed numerous times, that could also get into long-term memory. Like that phone number of that girlfriend that I had that I called thousands of times, right? Because I was desperate, I guess. And that's all we did was talk on the phone, right? I'll probably never forget that. Or let's say that information, right, that you learned from psychology class. If you're a psych major, you're gonna take lots of psych classes. You're gonna learn lots of things and you're gonna encounter some information over and over again, like maybe correlations or stuff about experiments or stuff about or whatever it is. If it's your major, you're gonna learn a lot about it. You're gonna see it many times. You'll probably remember that. I've been teaching these classes, right? Psych 101, other classes so long that I'm never gonna forget this stuff. I've been talking about it for 15 years. You know, twice a year, twice a semester. I mean, no, twice a year. Sometimes, multiple times, you have two psych 101s, right? Yeah, stuff rehearsed or that you've done over and over again. Long-term memory also works with retrieval cues. There are things that help you remember some of the stuff that's in there. Sometimes you think you don't remember, right, somebody's name. Like, let's say you can't remember that girlfriend's name. It's, you still can. It's in there, right? If it was meaningful to you, maybe you need a cue. You need a hint. Right? Like maybe I can't remember my first girlfriend's name for whatever reason. I can't think about it, but it's in there. I can remember it, right? I might need a hint and I might need to think, oh, uh, sounds like mermaid. And then I remember, oh, yeah, Myrna. That was her name. Myrna, right? Ugly ass name to tell you the truth, right? <laughs> right? It, it, okay, okay. That, that sounds mean, right? But it, that's in kind of an old fashioned name. It's not so popular any, anymore, right? Um, but that was her name, right? I'm, I'm sorry to make fun of that, make light of that. Yeah, that's not fair. Okay, but yeah. Um, yeah, that would, that would help me remember her name. Sounds like mermaid, right? Uh, but that's how long-term memory works. It works with retrieval cues. There's more about long-term memory. There are certain kinds of memories, certain kinds of long-term memories that are special and seem to be stored differently, okay? Uh, and one type of special kind of uh, long-term memory is called the flashbulb memory, right? A flashbulb memory, is a vivid memory of a highly emotional event. A flashbulb memory is a memory of something that was extremely emotional. And, I'm, and we're talking about stuff that's really emotional. Now, a lot of you cannot relate to this, but the news of a, a catastrophe, for instance, would, be, would create a flashbulb memory if you live to that. For people like me, people maybe who are a little bit younger and older, 9-11 is one of those flashbulb memories. It was that day when terrorists attacked the U.S. And basically they hijacked some planes and they flew those planes into the World Trade Center. Destroyed those buildings, they collapsed, right? A lot of people died, thousands of people died. You know, a war was started. It was a horrible day in American history. I'm probably never gonna forget that. And even telling you about it now, I'm getting a little bit emotional, right? It's that kind of memory. It's a highly emotional, memory. It is so emotional that it's very vivid. You remember where you were, what you were doing, who you talked to, right? It's almost as if you have photographic memory all of a sudden, but you do not. It's a special kind of memory. It's a very emotional memory. It's called the flashbulb memory. It's called flashbulb because it's like somebody took a picture and the flash went off, right? Research has shown that it is easily remembered. These memories are easily remembered because they're very emotional. And we'll eventually talk about how emotions help store memories. Consequentiality, a lot of important changes, a lot of important consequences because of that event. A lot of things changed, okay? Wars were started. Wars, by the way, that are still going on, you know? Um, 
a lot of people died. A lot of things changed. Uh, new laws were passed. You have different laws now because of 9-11. Because of 9-11, now the government is spying you all on you all the time. They know what you're searching for on the internet. They're tracing your calls. They know who you call. They know when you call. They know where you live. They know everything because they're always looking at us now. Because of that event, it changed history. Right? Don't let that make you paranoid, right? If you're a law-abiding citizen, shouldn't get into any trouble. But if you're doing stuff that's illegal, they might bust you, even if it's not terrorism related, okay? Uh, there's also a lot of rehearsal with that information. During, after 9-11, right? 9-11, uh, like right? Uh, people talked about it and they thought about the event a lot. I remember talking to my mom. I remember talking to, you know, uh, my, uh, my colleagues. At, uh, I was in graduate school. I remember, you know, watching it on the news over and over again for weeks and months. That's all they talked about on the news. So guess what? You thought about it a lot. You got to rehearse it a lot. Those are reasons why it's so easy to remember. But research does show that this, these memories do fade with time. You do lose some details. They do fade with time, but it is still a very strong memory. Now, we can break up long-term memories into other types as well. There are what we call declarative memories. So the flashbulb memories are a special kind of emotional memory, which will fit into some of these types that we're going to talk about right now. Uh, there are different types of long-term memories. We have what are called declarative memories or explicit memories. They're called declarative because you can declare, you can talk about them, you're aware of it, right? You can easily express these memories. They're also called explicit. And there's two kinds. There's semantic memory and episodic memories. Semantic memory is memory of general information, facts, rules. Semantic memory is memory for things you can write in a book. Like how many feet there are in a mile, 5,280. I don't know why exactly that number sticks, but I remember that. Probably because I like science, okay? And it's a fact about how long a mile is. And there's 660 acres in a square mile. I like things like that for some reason. I remember those things very easily. Um, general facts, information. Who was the first president? You know, uh, what is the name of our current president? You know, that kind of stuff. That's all semantic memory. It's memory for things that involve words, okay? But we also have episodic memories, memory for specific events, memory of the last time you voted, if you've ever voted, or memory of your last birthday, you know, or the memory of your first kiss or something like that. Those are episodic memories. They're episodes in your life, specific events in your life. Semantic memory and episodic memories are both declarative memory. You can easily talk about them. You're aware of them. They are explicit. It's, it's obvious that these memories exist. But we also have what are called non-declarative memories or implicit memories. These are memories that are not easily expressed. We're not very aware of them. We assume they exist, but they're non-declarative. They're hard to talk about. It's hard to be aware of them, okay? They're there, but they're hard to express. And some of those are called procedural memories. Procedural memories are memories for things that you do, motor skills and habits. So to think of that simply, uh, declarative memories, I mean declarative, uh, procedural memories are memories for things that you do, right? Like movements. Driving is a movement. You move your hands a certain way, uh, right? Your feet a certain way for the gas and, and, uh, and the brake, right? Uh, those are procedural memories. Or when you swim, when you, if you do gymnastics or you know how to ride a bike, you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to write, those are all procedural memories. There are memories for things that you do physically, for motor skills, for habits, things you do. Again, again, motor skills just refers to movement. You know how to play the piano, right? You develop that skill. That's a procedural memory. They said that you never forget how to ride a bike. You know, it's, uh, it's, it involves memory, a physical kind of memory called the procedural memory. That's a non-declarative memory, an implicit memory. It's hard to explain that, right? How do you ride a bike? You just know how to do it. It's hard to explain how the memory works. And also emotional memories are also non-declarative memories, implicit. We remember a lot of things emotionally and we don't always understand why. Like learned emotional reactions, you know? Like when you see, when you see a rat and you feel disgusted, 
why does a rat make you feel disgusted? The, the truth is, is that rats are associated with things are, that are disgusting, like filth and disease and trash and things like that. So it's classically conditioned. It's a learned emotional reaction, right? But also other things, like when you like someone, right? Can you explain why you like someone? It's very hard to do that. You're going to say, well, it's because, you, you know, she's good looking or he's good looking or because, you know, uh, you know, uh, we grew up together, right? And reality is that you don't know. The reality is, is that those people that you like are associated with positive things. They are. They may be associated with laughter, with partying, with good times, right? Uh, you know, with your childhood, which was a happy childhood, hopefully. That's why you like certain people. And when you love someone, you're attracted to a certain kind of person, right? Maybe you like, uh, you know, I don't know, brunettes or blondes, or maybe you like girls with glasses, or you like guys who are tall or buff or whatever it is, whatever your type is. You don't even understand why you like those kind of people. It is all emotional. And the reality is, is that they probably remind you of someone else that you like or something else that's positive. It is basically a learned emotional reaction. It is an emotional reaction. It's an emotional, uh, it's an emotional memory. They are hard to explain, but they involve memory. And by the way, flashbulb memories are a type of emotional memory, but they're a special kind, right? Um, here's a figure, here's a flow chart to help put it together. So there's different kinds of long-term memory. Long-term memory can be broken up into explicit, non-declarative memories. That includes procedural memory, skills and actions, and emotional memories, right? Emotional conditioning, class conditioning stuff, right? And long-term memories can also be broken up into explicit memories or declarative memories, things you can declare or talk about. That includes episodic memories, so specific events, things that happened to you, things you remember, things you did, right? And then semantic memories, things that has to do with words, knowledge, concepts, numbers, information, right? So there's different kinds of long-term memories. And that, it's important to realize that because not all memory, their memories aren't equal. Guess what? If you should develop Alzheimer's and you start losing memories, you're not going to lose them all equally. The memories that are going to go first are going to be your semantic memories. You're going to start forgetting information and facts. You're going to start you're going to start forgetting what certain things are called, certain names, okay? But you'll still remember those episodes. You'll still remember those procedural memories, those emotional memories. As Alzheimer's progresses, you will eventually start forgetting also episodes in your life. You'll forget that you've done certain things. Like maybe you'll start cooking and you turn on the stove and you will forget that you did that and you think you haven't done that and then you're likely to burn down the house. And as you get older, you will even forget those people you love. You will forget those people and how you, people that are close to you and that you love them, you care for them. And after a while, they will seem like strangers to you. And some of the last things you'll forget are procedural memories. Eventually, you'll forget how to talk, how to walk, how to bathe, how to do everything. And you'll just be a lump sitting there before you die. That's a little bit about how Alzheimer's prog progresses. I know I'm not an expert in Alzheimer's, but I know a little bit about it, okay? And um, it just comes to show that memories are not all the same. They're not all equal. They're not all, all lost in the same way. And they, they're stored, by the way, in different parts of the brain. Um, here's a review of the atkinson Schiffer model. We just talked about the atkinson Schiffer model the theory that explains how memory works, now you should be able to look at this and understand it. So first, you have sensory input, you see something, you hear something, that becomes part of sensory memory, okay? Information that's not transferred to the next step will be lost. So if you immediately look away, if you don't think about the information, what you see, what you hear, whatever it is, right, you will immediately forget it within a few seconds. If you pay attention, do something with the information, it gets into short-term memory. With short-term memory, that's when you're using information. So you are actually rehearsing information when you use it, when you're thinking about it, when you're working with it. It's also called working memory. Anything that's not transferred to the next step will be lost. Yes, if you don't rehearse it enough, if you don't use it enough, it will eventually disappear. 
It might be in a few minutes, okay? If you use the information enough, it will get into long-term memory. Things that you remember for years, maybe decades, stuff you've rehearsed over and over again, stuff that is meaningful to you, stuff that's traumatic. Okay, that's the Atkinson Schifrin model of memory. If you understand it, you should be able to look at this flow chart and understand how it works. Okay, the next part is about reconstruction and other things related to memory. We will stop here. We're a little bit less than halfway, but it's okay. Uh, we're, you know, we are about halfway. So we will stop there. I will stop recording.